Hello, and welcome to The Chirp. I'm Andrew Michel, and today I'm chatting with the Head of Special Collections and Archives here at Keene State. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Rodney Obien. I am Head of Special Collections and Archives at Mason Library, uh, Keene State College, of course. I'm also an, as an associate professor, uh, and I teach in the History Department in our new program, the Masters in History and Archives. I guess that's the proper name for it, so. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so where did your interest in history begin, Rodney? Well, I was, uh, actually, my interest in history began as an undergraduate. I, I got my BA in history, and um, there were many things that I wanted to consider as I was a senior. What, what, what was I going to do when I got out? And decided, rather than going to teaching, which is great, I decided to go into archives. And so I've been doing that ever since. So, All right. Uh, so... What specifically made you pursue that Master's of Science in Library Science? Uh, so there are many ways to um, I get, get your accreditation, qualifications to become an archivist or a, you know, a curator. And one of those uh, is to get your Master's in Library Science, which I did. And um, it, it, my particular program had a specialization in archives in um, specifically museum archives. So I, I was at that time working for the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Washington, D.C., and I, I was already in the, in the museum world, so I just decided to do it and did it, and so, yeah. So, Very interesting. Uh -huh. So you said you worked in the museum world for a mm -hmm. while. Which museum was that? And well, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, it's a headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, it's kind of the um, premier historical preservation or, you know, anything dealing with preserving old buildings, landscapes, and so forth. Um, it is involved, and it's kind of a um, sister organization to the National Trust in the U.K. Um, my, the particular department I worked for um, oversaw the, at that time, 18 historic sites throughout the nation. Um, and so I worked in the museum division, um, and I was the archivist on staff. Um, and I got to go to many big estates, like the Rockefeller estate. I did a lot of work at Kaikit and, um, and, and sort of north of New York City, um, several Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Uh, if, Folks are familiar with Stockbridge, Mass. There's a place called Chester Wood, and it's the home and studio of Daniel Chester French. And I did some work. So I, I was, uh, I did a lot of traveling. I was a roving archivist. I was a roving archivist for for a few years. So um, is that uncommon for an archivist? Very uncommon. Um, they, most archivists are stationary. They, <laughs> they have a collection, um, and they are, you know, they stay there. You know, but. Um, they curate it, they organize it, they preserve it. Um, but for me, it was I was more of a technical advisor and going to site to site, just helping the local staff organize, archive their stuff. So well, it was fun. It was fun. I, I, I put a lot of miles. I had a lot of frequent flyer miles as a, as a young man So at that time. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I see that you moved from a similar position at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute to to Keene State. Mm -hmm. So what brought you from there to Keene State? A uh, commute. Um, uh, so for a while I was a curator of special collections at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and a uh, wonderful job. Um, but it was a two and a half hour one way five and five hour commute round trip, and so I actually had to stay stay down there a few nights a week just just uh, not uh, go bonkers from from the commute but uh, this job came up at Keene State uh, they, they had in 2009 um, advertised for their first full-time college archivist and I applied and I'm here Oh, so you're the first Keene State archivist. A full-time, tenured. Uh, th there have been some archivists in the past and special collections librarians but I was assured that I was the first uh, tenured faculty college archivist, Keene State College. Oh, well, that's awesome. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. So how are those two collections between WPI and Keene State different? 
Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Well, they were similar in the sense they were they were very eclectic. So at WPI, I had a lot of engineering collections, patents. Um, uh, WPI had a long history uh, with educating some of the workers and managers for the to big and uh, big companies in, in the area. So we had a lot of records relating to industry and uh, and uh, manufacturing and, and so forth. Um, it, oddly enough, they had a large collection of Charles Dickens materials, um, really? books and original letters and so forth. And so, um, yeah, so a lot of engineering, science, and, and then a lot of Charles Dickens. Here at Keene State, um, a collection... Uh, Focus is a lot on school history, you know, going back to 1909 and the, and the inception of the normal school, Key Normal. Um, uh, and uh, we have a, quite a large book collection, about 18,000 volumes. New Hampshire history, New Hampshire literature, kind of a New Hampshire focus. But um, the significant difference is that there is, there, we have a focus on social justice and civil rights uh, materials, as well as film. And we have a, a, a significant film archive here, which is different from what I had to take care of at Worcester Polytechnic. So, um, Very cool. I actually remember when I, when I worked for you, I spent uh -huh. like about a month scanning old yearbooks. Yes. <laughs> back in that uh, scanning room up on the second floor. Yeah, though it's... And people don't think too much about those sorts of things, but... Um, that's a lot of you know interesting information and, and memories. I think that's that's you know um, so, and we still have those that you scanned and they're they're somewhere in the I don't know in the cloud and big <laughs> access somewhere up there somewhere up there yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. Uh, is there a specific area of study that you focus on? Um, when I'm not here, uh, being College Archivist, Head of Special Collections. I, I do a lot of work with art documentation. Um, I, I'm right now archiving the collection of a pop artist, an American pop artist by the name of Robert Watson Munford. Um, he did a lot of his work in the 1960s in Europe. Um, and so uh, I, I archive art, I archive his papers, um, do lots of exhibitions and so forth, and so that's kind of my interest out, you know, sort of area of art, art, art documentation, art archiving. If that's okay. so, it's kind of a tongue twister there. Art archiving. Okay. A lot of A's. A lot of, a lot of A's. A lot of A's. Yeah. So, Should, have you ever heard of like the Lost Media Wiki? I've heard of it. I haven't seen. It. I gotta check. What, so, what it's, is it uh, about? It's you, you reminded me of it because it, they try to like they try to preserve different forms of media that are kind of going extinct. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have like a bunch of old films that they're trying to either you know, store or restore. Uh, they do like old TV episodes, old video games, mm -hmm. like stuff that people were assuming would always be there, so nobody bothered to back them up. So they try and find this <laughs> lost media that you know, people were like, oh, well, of course that'll still be around. Nothing will ever happen to our studio. And then a building burns That's... down and everybody goes, oh, we lost all the... You yeah. lost the originals, and somebody you know, says, "Oh, I have the v a VHS tape from my grandfather." And that's usually all that exists, I mean, and that's a common story with, um, with archives. It's just you always think that someone else is going to archive it, but if you don't, you know, yeah. it's gone. It, it goes. It goes on a wiki, lost. <laughs> yeah. So uh, interesting. Uh huh. Go ahead. Go, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any interesting projects going on at the archives right now? Uh, hmm. I, I think the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, and I wish I could just say, uh, just blurt them out right away. I'll, one, one that actually is taking place in this building, the Mac building, it involves our film archive. Um, we are the home of uh, the award-winning, uh, Academy Award-winning um, New Hampshire film producer, Louis de Rochemont. Um, oh. 
So some, a lot of folks here in New Hampshire may uh, be familiar with Louis de Rochemont as the, in the maker of the, the film Lost Boundaries. It's kind of a film about passing. It's a, fam- it's a story based on the Johnson family um, who were African-American, but they were passing as white. And so, this, the, so, we, ha- well, so we have the, actually we have a lot of materials relating to that film. Um, and so uh, some of the other films that Louis de Rochemont made. Um, so in, in the moment, we are rehousing, re-inventorying, cataloging the collection. There's about maybe 500 actual reels of film. Um, and at the same time, we're working with the de Rochemont family, the Library of Congress, um, and some other organizations to digitally restore some of the films. And one of the films that um, was restored recently, digitally restored, was a film, I think it was made in 1956, 1956, 1957, in, that, in the sort of late 1950s, called uh, The Whistle of Eaton Falls. Um, and it's, it starred Lloyd Bridges, and it was the first film that um, Ernest Borgnine, um, you know, maybe that's a little too old school for, for, for it's a little old school for me, I'm, I'm, you know. Um, but uh, one of the first films he starred in, we, so it was restored well, in this collaboration with the Library of Congress and the de Rochemont family and premiered on TMC, you know, on, 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 you know on, on, and it got a really nice write up in the New Yorker magazine. So we're, we're actively um, pro- reprocessing, rehousing this, this massive collection. Um, and finding ways to uh, digitize and share this, this this archive that we have, so it's pretty unique. Um, so that's one thing. I don't know how many how many how many things <laughs> do I have? To <laughs> Let's see. You have class of one. Yeah, so the, the second thing, uh, we we were we were a home for many significant collections. Uh, um, we're, uh, so the, this the, the collection I like to mention is the Orang Asli archive, which um, Orang Asli, the Orang Asli are um, a group of eighteen to twenty um, indigenous um, uh, groups in Peninsular Malaysia. These are folks who were there before the Malaysians came. In a home mm-hmm. sense. So um, we are, if not the largest repository in the world, one of the largest repositories in the world that collect um, documentation, the history, culture of these people. And so um, we've, we've had a lot of collaborations going on. I, I actually right now have been in talks with um, folks at Lund University in Sweden. They have a digital archive of similar material. So we're collaborating back and forth. I'm talking to colleagues at the University of Malaya or Malaysia, they call Malaya there. And so, uh, and we're working with them to collect more material, digitize more material, and um, work with some of the indigenous groups there to train them. And this is, this is something I, you asked me earlier, what, what, what am I involved in? I, I should have said, uh, the other thing I'm involved with is sort of grassroots archiving, training people. Normal people, you know, like you, you look at you, um, to archive their history and you know and, and so forth. So I, I go out uh, when I can locally in the state and, and train folks at different towns and cities. I also do that internationally when I can. So the folks at Orang Asli, you know, we're working to train each of these, um, you know, these uh, indigenous groups to to archive their culture and, and share that that with. Everyone, so or share it with us so we can archive it. So I, I think, yeah, I could, I could keep going on, but those are, those are some of the big projects that are going on, and um, you know, for such a small collection, it's um, or just comparatively, we we do some pretty high end, I guess. Is that good? High end stuff. Okay. Yeah, I never would have known that right around the corner from where I go to class, there was such a big piece of history there. That's all, yeah, so, and a lot of people don't. So that's kind of the thrill that I get, um, is showing people what we have. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, so, but, uh, 
Yeah, uh, lots of, there's lots going on, and those are the two biggest things that, that come to mind. Um, but we we are always twenty four seven interested in making those collections, uh, even even though they're high end, accessible to just our students. So you know, you Andrew, I mean, you you know, you worked with us for a while. But if you as a student wanted to come and see something, we would uh, make it available. You know, we have an Oscar, one of uh, Louis de Rochemont's Oscars. Yes. Really? So I always show it. Um, if you wanted to come see it, you can still, you know, make an appointment. You can come see it. We we pride ourselves in um, give trying to let students experience what you know archive is, or or um, having them. You know, being able to access things without a lot of barriers, because a lot of archives and special collections, it had to be a qualified researcher. You have to have letters of introduction. You know, um, it's very formal, and not everybody can see things. Um, I do research occasionally in abroad, and. I have to make an appointment six months in advance. I have to talk to kind of several people, letters and so forth. I have a specific appointment when I have to be there or else, you know, go back in line and start over again. But yeah, we have a little, we, we are formal sense that we make people, um, when they're handling materials, be careful and use proper, you know, handling and care practices. But in terms of, if you wanted to see something and it's not fa it's not too fragile to to handle, just make an appointment, call, email, you know, and um, we'll you know we'll hook you up. You know, that's, that's oh, excellent. Kinda, yeah. Uh, so jumping back a little bit, sure. the um, grassroots mm -hmm. archiving you mentioned. Uh, why is it important to you to spread that word and teach well, people about that? I, you know, particularly in a state like New Hampshire and in northern New England. The work being done to preserve history, history, history being archival, you know, and artifacts and so forth, isn't really being done by professional museum curators, professional archivists. Um, yeah, uh, it's done by volunteers, you know, retired people, students, interns, and so uh, I get into arguments quite a bit with my colleagues who insist that only people with X degree and background can do the work. And I said, well, most places can't afford to pay. They, they don't have any money, you know? And, and so, right. so the quandary is, what do you do? Well, who's working on the materials? And so you train the people that are working on it, and that's what I do. And uh, I'm really into you know, so that idea of local control, people being able to care and preserve their own materials. And so if, if I can empower people on the local level, um, I think at, at least professionally, ethically, uh, philosophically, I'm sort of fulfilling kind of what I am, what, you know, what I've set out in the field to, to do is to, you know, to, you know, to save history, to save memory, you know, um, and it's not a, not, not, and if the more people I can get to do it, the better. You know, so. The more the merrier, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, uh -huh. uh, in my research, I found mention that you lived in a 200 year old farmhouse. At least you did back in 2009. I, I, I still live in the farmhouse. Um, it's, it's it belonged to my wife's family, and they you know they actually moved into New, to New Hampshire in the '60s, but it, it dates back to 1787, um, kind of the year of the Constitution. So, um, yeah, I, it's 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 a bit of a trip. Well, it's a trip driving because it's about an hour forty minutes from here to where I live, um, but. Yeah, it's like living in an antique, um, and you know, people read these novels or books, uh, or you know, we can, if you're a fan of Little House on the Prairie, um, Laura Ingalls, and you know how cold it was in the winter, and this and that. Well, that's not too far from my reality sometimes <laughs> because um, it is. It, 
it, older houses are not like new houses, and so, um, but it's been quite an experience. To, but it's, um, you know, it's not that old, old colonial. You know, it was uh, part of a land grant that, uh, on a land grant that uh, revolutionary soldiers um, received after the war. It meant hundred acres. I don't have it. It's a portion of the original hundred acres, but it's, um, yeah. Wow. So. It's it's quite an experience because I was uh, my father was in the military, so we just lived in military housing, and to kind of live in something like this is kind of like going to work, you know. Well, you, know <laughs> you, you know, taking care of an antique, taking care of history. So, Fascinating. Yeah. All right. Hmm? Uh, so as we wrap up here, is okay. there anything you'd like to add? Ah. Uh, I think, yeah, I, um, I think, Dad, it's, uh, the, you know, the, uh, I, the work I do, I spend a lot of time, you know, doing it, archiving, but I, I spend a lot of time teaching people how to do it, you know, whether on the local level or, you know, in, on our master's program in history and archives. But, you know, wh whatever I do, it's, um, Particularly with the students, I, I try to embed this this idea that what you're archiving is not just materials, papers, books, and stuff like that. It actually re represents someone's life. So you look at a box of papers. You know, let's say Andrew's papers. There, you know, we have your papers, for example. If you and you know, a lot of people will say, "Oh, that's just a bunch of folders and files," but that's all, you know, if you look at it and, um, uh, you know, let's, let's hypothetically saying you've been long gone and, and so these, these papers is all that are left of that person. It represents a life, life lived, you know, you know happy times, sad times, you know, things that you did, things that you hated to do, um, like we talked earlier, but it's a life, you know, and so archives, yeah, there are records and so forth, but they also are, in a lot of cases, all that's left of that person or that organization. So that's something I like to instill in people that I know is that when you look at a collection and say, oh, you know, maybe we should weed this and weed that out, well, remember, that's all that's left of that person, that history, that organization. So be careful, take care, you know, because your decisions will affect how what people can see or interpret in the future. So that's a very poetic way of looking at archives. I like that. I All like right. that a lot. Good. Uh, so my final, uh, my final question. Okay. Uh, almost said collection there. That's okay. It could be question or collection. Collection like, of questions. Maybe. Collection collection. <laughs> sure. sure. Uh, so what advice do you have for anyone interested in library sciences or working with archives material in general? Uh, before you get real serious about it, volunteer, you know, see, work with the material, see if it's what you like, you know. There's, um, you know, I, I can't say enough about just volunteering at your local historical society or if you're at a college or university, volunteering or interning there and just see if this is the kind of things that you like it. And if you like to play with old stuff, retro stuff, um, it, it's a good it's a good place to be, but um, I know there's a lot of people who uh, kind of fantasize about their profession, but had never um, actually worked and handled, and are sometimes disappointed. Now, you know that's usually not as common, but I I have a couple students now. I said, okay, you have a lot of enthusiasm for it, and I appreciate it, but yeah, why don't you just Play a little bit, work a little bit with it, and see if it's something you like to do. And if it is, it's a very, you know, at least for my sake uh, and, and, and my experience, a very fulfilling, you know, fulfilling career in many, as in many aspects. So. People tend to think it's a little more Indiana Jones than it is. I'd love to have it more be Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is. It's your, I don't know, it's really... Um, uh, it, 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 it can be really exciting. It, it, it can be deadly boring and just, um, just 
just exciting beyond your imagination. So in, in a split second, and that's the best way I can explain working with archives. So um, you can don't ask me for examples because I, I I can't demonstrate, <laughs> but I I can no guarantee you, you know. So um, but yeah, explore, try, and um, whether you decide to become an archivist or a curator or special collections librarian or not, come away with some, you know, a love for this material because, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it is, it is, it's precious. These things are precious to, you know, to have. And in a lot of, and people work very hard to make sure that you can access and, and um, enjoy them, you know, present and into the future, so. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming to talk to me today, You're Rodney. Welcome. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And, uh, if you could just let everybody know one more time how they could contact you. Sure, sure, to, sure, uh, sure. Um, sure. If uh, if folks are interested in visiting or archives or just seeing materials, it's best to make an appointment. Um, and you can do that by either uh, emailing archivists. Um, at keen.edu. Again, that's archivist at keen.edu. You can also call us at 603-358-2717. Uh, Actually, that's my direct number, 603-358-2717. Uh, uh, um, if people want to contact me directly by email, you can do that too, and that is R O. B, B as in boy, I E N at keen.edu. And so, um, you know, be glad to host people, you know, if you wanted to come look at, at a particular thing or just take a tour or just talk to me about shop, you know, um, what I do and why I do what I do. I'd be glad to talk to whoever. Uh, all right. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to The Chirp, music provided by composer Nathaniel Bridges. See you next time.